We're going to be in Judges chapter 15 today. If you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bible, we had to really focus on the praise earlier in the service because I know how depressing judges can be, right? But I am going to show you from the text today that our God is still worth praising even when we come across pretty cruddy people like Samson. So we're in our third week of four looking at the judgeship of Samson. If you'll remember Judges 13, we talked about the circumstances surrounding his birth. Last week in Judges 14, we talked about the dysfunction surrounding his wedding and then his outright defiance of really doing what God asks him to do. So before we get into chapter 15, let's just recap very quickly how chapter 14 ended. Remember, Samson proposes this riddle that he gives to the Philistines, and if they can get it right, Samson will give them clothing. If they get it wrong, they'll give him clothing. The Philistines are able to solve the riddle because his wife gives them the answer. And in the final two verses of Judges chapter 14, it says this, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon, and struck down thirty men of the town, and took their spoil, and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man." So as a result of losing the bet, Samson has to leave his wife and go and provide clothing for the Philistines. And that's how chapter 14 ends, with him basically abandoning his wife. So as we work our way through chapter 15 today, I want you to notice three observations from the text. Number one, we see an angry husband. Number two, we see a comfortably oppressed people. And then number three, we see a glimmer of hope. So number one, an angry husband. Number two, a comfortably oppressed people. And number three, a glimmer of hope. As we work our way through the passage, number one, an angry husband. Here's what happens. We know, based on the text, that Samson was gone at least a couple of months because we're told in verse one, at the time of wheat harvest, Most people think that was around May. Most people think he was married early spring. So he abandons his wife, let's say, around March, and he returns around May, the time of the wheat harvest. And when he returns, he's expecting to get to see his wife. And when I say the word see, I mean in quotes, as Judges 15 tells us, he wanted to go into his wife. He wanted to have sex with his wife. But here's the problem. Her father's not going to allow that to happen. And you know why he's not going to allow that to happen? Because Samson left his wife. So as a dutiful father, he makes alternative arrangements. He finds another man for her to marry. When Samson finds out about this, he's not a happy camper. And we're told that when he knocks on the door, he gives his wife a young goat. Now, for us, that means absolutely nothing. If you received a goat this afternoon from your husband or your wife, unless you're J. Paul and Jeremiah, you'd probably be very disappointed. (laughs) However, in ancient Israel, a young goat is the modern-day equivalent of like a box of chocolates, okay? So it makes sense in the context. But here's the problem. Look at verse 1 because there's a very interesting phrase here. It says, Samson went to visit his wife. That should stand out to you. When I go home every day, I'm not going home to visit my wife and my children. A visit implies some sort of short-term stay. It would not be a wise move for any of us in this room today to say we're going home to visit our family. No, you're going home to live with your family. If you're a husband, you're going home to provide for your wife and children, love your wife and children, cherish them, be the spiritual leader of the household. You're not going home to visit your family. In the same way, when I had just become a father, I made the mistake of telling some lady in our previous church that I was in charge of Beckett that night. I was going to babysit Beckett. And she stopped me and said, you are not babysitting your son. You're the father of your son. You take care of your son. You're not the babysitter. As 
what that implied was Ashley was really the one who took care of him. I was just the hired help. No. Samson had the wrong mentality. He was not there, or he should have not been there, to visit his wife. So that's a red flag, first and foremost. So he gives her this young goat, and he's expecting in return to have some time with his wife. But the father-in-law says, no. I've already found her somebody else. But here's what I'm going to do for you, Samson. I'm going to offer you my younger daughter. And then the father-in-law says something that he shouldn't, And that is, my younger daughter is actually better looking than the one you married anyways. Do you see the amount of horrible things that we read in the book of Judges? And this is not the response, however, that Samson wanted to hear. So he lashes out in anger. Look at verses 4 and 5 with me. Here's what the text tells us. So Samson went, after he found out that he was not going to get his wife, he went and he caught 300 foxes and he took torches and he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails and when he had set fire to the torches he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain as well as the olive orchards so Samson this time Instead of ruining the Philistines physically by the slaughtering of men, he's looking to ruin them economically by burning all of their fields, all of their grain, all of their olive orchards. He wants to completely decimate their food source, not only to keep themselves alive, but that they might use to sell to others. So what do the Philistines do in response? Well, the text tells us that they don't actually mess with Samson. Instead... They go to Samson's wife and his father-in-law. But the problem with that is, neither one of them had anything to do with Samson doing this. But we're told in verse 6 that the Philistines burn Samson's wife and his father-in-law with fire. Now what's interesting is, if you remember back in chapter 14... Samson's wife, the whole reason she rats out Samson is because she's afraid she's going to get in trouble with her Philistine family members and friends. She doesn't want to die, so she rats out Samson and gives them the answer to the riddle. But nothing happens to her in chapter 14, but in a cruel twist of fate, Samson's wife, who had avoided being punished in chapter 14, now reaps the consequences for Samson's sin in chapter 15. Do you notice here, throughout the story of Samson, the consequences of sin at work? See, many times we individualize our sin. We take it personally. We think to ourselves that our sin only affects me. But as we've worked our way through the Old Testament, which we did in 2020, you see time and time again that the sin of an individual rarely just stops with them. It affects future generations. It affects other family members. The consequences for our sin, they don't just affect us. They affect our family members. And guess what? They can also affect the church. They can affect this body. So our sin really matters. So how do we ensure that sin doesn't fester within our hearts and minds? We know that as followers of Jesus, we're going to sin So how do we ensure that we don't allow it to fester? How do we ensure that we don't allow it to take root deep down within our hearts and our minds? And the answer is very simple. We stay in communion with God through prayer. We regularly read the scriptures. We have times of confession, corporately and privately. We gather weekly in this room to encourage one another, hold one another accountable, rebuke one another if we're off base. The basic, simple, spiritual disciplines. There was an article written in 1989 in an academic journal called Sociological Theory. Now, in this article, the author of the article had studied hundreds of swimmers of all skill levels, amateurs, professional swimmers, Olympic swimmers, and he was trying to find out in this article what makes swimmers 
excellent. Now let me define what he means by excellent. Excellence, he says, is consistent superiority of performance. So he did all this research. Here's what he found. Excellence in swimming was not the product of personality characteristics. It was not the result of quantitative changes in behavior, which is a fancy way of saying basically if a swimmer just suddenly decided one day to train more, that did not necessarily mean his time was going to increase in whatever race he was swimming in. And then number three, excellence does not result from some special inner talent he found. Here's where excellence came from, he said. Excellence is accomplished through the doing of actions, ordinary in themselves, performed consistently and carefully, habitualized, compounded together, and added up over time. That's what he found. As he studied excellent swimmers, it was the daily grind of doing the same thing over and over and over again. You know how sin doesn't fester within our hearts and within our church? If we do the ordinary, basic things over and over and over again, if you make a conscious decision to be in God's word, to commune with him through prayer, to gather every week for the weekly gathering. If you do those things, there's nothing special or magical about any of them in and of themselves. But if you go about your business, the daily grind of being with him in the word and in prayer, here's the problem with the spiritual discipline. So many of us, we want to wait until we feel like reading God's word. That's a huge mistake. We want to wait to pray to God when we feel spiritual enough to pray to him. We want to gather with the body as long as we have absolutely nothing else going on that weekend. That's not how the daily grind of the spiritual disciplines work. If you're waiting to be excited all of the time to gather for worship or to pray or to read your Bible, you'll never get there because we're human beings and things come up. And we get distracted. And we get discouraged. Now what I'm not telling you is just basically doing the spiritual disciplines. That doesn't mean automatically that you're going to grow in your faith. Because we all know that we can go through the motions. We can not be paying attention as we read. We can have the television on as we're doing our Bible reading. We can pray with our eyes wide open as we're on the baseball field or whatever. So there's all of these ways that you can not be intentional within the spiritual disciplines. But brothers and sisters, let me just challenge you to make the effort to be diligent in just doing it over and over and over again. All of the spiritual disciplines, they're interconnected. So when you're not in God's word, it's not surprising that you wouldn't want to pray or that you wouldn't want to gather with your church family. And when you're not gathering with your church family consistently, it's not surprising to me that you're not interested in praying or reading God's word because all of these disciplines are interconnected. But over time, if you do them, and more importantly, if you pray that God would give you the desire to do them, I believe he will. He will give you the desire to make that a consistent part of your life. Here's what the article said. He says, it is incorrect to believe that top athletes suffer great sacrifices to achieve their goals. Often, they don't see what they do as sacrificial at all because they like it. That's the goal. We want to get to the point that we are so consistent individually in reading God's word praying, gathering with worship, that to not show up for it would be like something is drastically missing from my life. We want to hunger and thirst for God's word and righteousness so much that if we go longer than a day or two, we, we crave it. We need it. My prayer for our church is that God would stir up our hearts to view the daily, often mundane habits of Bible reading and prayer and gathering with one another in worship, that that would be something that we don't have to do, but something that we get to do every single time we're together. 
The problem with Samson in this passage is because he's disconnected from Yahweh, his sin not only creeps into his own heart and mind, it's now beginning to trickle out into the hearts of others. And in revenge, we're told in verse 8 that Samson strikes down the Philistines with a great blow. That phrase that you find there, hip and thigh, that's a wrestling idiom. It means a total victory. So Samson completely wipes out the Philistines here in verse 8. As we keep moving through the passage, number two, we see a comfortably oppressed people. Look at verses 9 through 11. You see, unfortunately, instead of the Israelites praising Samson for slaughtering the Philistines, they complained to him, look, then the Philistines came up and they encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? They said, we have come up to bind Samson, to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so have I done to them. What's tragic about this passage is that the Israelites appear to be completely content with the Philistines ruling over them. They're fine with it. They don't want to do anything. They don't want Samson to do anything that would rock the boat. Look, we don't like the Philistines. Yeah, they're kind of mean, but as long as we walk the straight and narrow and they tell us to do what we're supposed to do and we do it, we're going to be safe. We're going to be protected. We might even have peace. But as one commentator points out, what the Israelites don't realize is that this Philistine aggression that is taking place at Lehi is actually a way to break the comfortable relationship that has existed between Israel and the Philistines. God did not want the Israelites to be comfortable under Philistine oppression. And in chapter 14, when God used Samson's riddle to create this initial hostility between Samson and the Israelites. He is using in chapter 15 this Philistine aggression as another way to break down the peaceful relationship that had come to exist between the Philistines and Samson. So we have to ask the question, how is it possible that the Israelites are comfortable under the oppression of a foreign power? It's the same way that Israel was comfortable when they were in Egypt. Remember the story? Moses unleashes all of the plagues. Pharaoh finally allows the Israelites to leave. They make it to the Red Sea. They turn around and they see the Egyptians chasing after them. And they complain to Moses. In chapter 14, 11, and 12, it says, They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die In the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. This is not the first time that the Israelites have been comfortable living under foreign oppression. Even though they were not in charge, they felt secure. They felt at peace. Now, while none of us in this room are under the oppression of a foreign nation, those in this room that are not in Christ are under oppression. You're under the bondage of sin. And you know why evangelism in 2022 is so difficult? Because a lot of people that are lost in their sin and destined for life away from God forever... They don't even realize that their sin's a problem. And you know why they don't realize their sin's a problem? Because sin deceives. So many people that we know are walking around lost, dead in their sin. And they think that they're okay because their life is successful. They have a job. They're making money. 
They have financial flexibility to go and do fun things. Their health is okay. I was talking with a gentleman in our own church who serves at the harbor faithfully every week. He was meeting with a man not long ago trying to share the gospel with him, trying to help him understand his need for a savior and how he was lost in his sin. And the man straight up told all church member, I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. I I like having sex, he said. And I want to do it my way whenever I want to do it. And our church member responded appropriately, The reason you think that way is because you are deceived in your sin. That's one of the ways that sin works. It deceives us. Let me speak to those in the room for a moment that are not in Christ. If you are here today and you think you're saved because you occasionally maybe lie or get angry or break the law, but your life still seems to be fine, you still have a job, your family's still healthy, you seem, seem to be doing well, then that indicates to me that you don't understand the gospel. Because the gospel is not about a good person waking up and seeing the gospel and saying, oh, this is going to make me better. No. The gospel is for sinners in need of a Savior. Nothing else, brothers and sisters, Now I'm talking to saved people in the room. Nothing else will save you. Lost people, nothing else will save you. Your morality will not save you. Knowing enough Bible trivia will not save you. Jesus is the only one who saves. You see, sin deceives us into thinking that as long as I don't get caught, or I don't lose my job, or I'm not unhealthy, that I must be okay with God. Deception. The lie of American Christianity right there. We follow biblical Christianity. If you decide that I'm just going to take my chances, that I've done enough, that I've been good enough, nice enough, shown up to church occasionally because culturally it's what you do here. It won't be enough because salvation is not based on our effort in any way, shape, or form. You see, Israel was comfortable in their oppression because life was going well for them. And when God called them out of Egypt and told them to take the promised land, That wasn't a call to settle under the leadership of a foreign nation. It was a call to take the land. But they have forgotten that in this passage. So they go to Samson in verses 12 and 13. And Samson agrees to be bound up and tied by the Israelites. His only request is that they are not the ones to mess with him. Look at verses 14 through 17 as we continue to walk our way through this passage. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. We've seen that now three or four times just in the Samson narrative. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire. And his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. And put out his hand and took it. And with it he struck a thousand men. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck down a thousand men. And as soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand And that place was called Ramath-Lehi. There was this tension that had existed. The Israelites are looking to Samson to deliver them from foreign oppression. Even though they were comfortable at this moment, it was still Samson's job, his call by God, to take care of his people. Now, what do we read about here? He takes a fresh jawbone. That's an indication to us. Fresh means something here. It's another violation of Samson's Nazarite vow. I've lost count 
of how many times Samson has disobeyed the vow that his parents made before God about how Samson would live his life. And he takes that fresh jawbone and he slaughters a thousand Philistines. Even though Israel is comfortable under foreign oppression, God is still going to accomplish what he set out to do for his people. So number three, we see a glimmer of hope. Look at verse 18. If there's any verse that redeems Samson, it's verse 18. And he was very thirsty, and he called upon the Lord and said, You have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant. And shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? What's significant about this verse? Number one, it's the only time in the entire Samson narrative that Samson actually ever talks to God. I'm not saying he didn't do it, but in terms of what we find in Judges, this is the only example we have of Samson communicating directly to Yahweh. Yes, the Spirit of the Lord has rushed upon him a few times, but the author indicates to us that this is the only time that Samson ever talks to God. Not only does Samson request water, but he actually acknowledges that salvation for Israel came from Yahweh through the hand of Samson. We see just a tiny glimmer of hope here in Samson's life. But the reason I use the word glimmer of hope is because when you look in the Hebrew text, the word that the author uses here for crying out to God, it's not the same word that we find used elsewhere in Judges. It seems that even though Samson is crying out to God, you know why he's primarily crying out to God? Because he's thirsty. Because he needs help. He's not as concerned about making sure that the Israelites survive. He wants water, and he does not want to face the humiliation of getting defeated by these uncircumcised Philistines. He's calling out to God out of pride. He's not calling out to God for the good of Israel. How many times, if we're being honest, are we guilty of approaching God in prayer this way? Perhaps we bring a request before God just so that we can avoid humiliation, embarrassment, or defeat? How many of our prayers are laced with hidden intentions? We're a lot more like Samson than we care to realize. I love this quote from Tim Keller. He basically says, when you pray to God and you thank God, but he doesn't give you what you want, and you're upset with God about it, That really only means that all you did was pray to God for your agenda rather than what God actually wanted to do in and through your life. So we see this glimmer of hope. And as this episode unfolds in verse 19, in spite of Samson's constant disobedience, constant lack of respect for the Philistines, lack of respect for his wife, his family... What does God do? In verse 19, we're told God splits open the hollow place and water comes out. And Samson drinks it, his spirit returns, and he is revived. So here's the question. Why would God continue to take care of Samson and the Israelites in spite of their behavior? Why? Why does God do this? Let me summarize what One commentator wrote, As we have witnessed so many times before, contrary to the reader's expectations, in the book of Judges, God operates not on the basis of traditional orthodoxy, which teaches that obedience brings blessing and disobedience a curse. On the contrary, like the nation of Israel herself, Samson deserves no consideration from God. Yet Yahweh hears and delivers time and time again. His agenda for his people cannot fail, despite the people's seeming determination to commit national suicide. Don't miss what the story of Samson shows us. Samson doesn't deserve 
God's help. Israel does not deserve to be delivered from oppression time and time again until you realize that ultimately the book of Judges, ultimately all of God's word, everything that happens in the existence of this universe is not about us as it is about God's glory. That's why God helps Samson in this passage because it brings glory to himself. It elevates the name of Yahweh. If you're in Christ today, God's plan for your life will not fail. He is sovereign. That's no motivational speak. Believe me, I'm not trying to pump you up as you leave today. But if you are in Christ, God's plan will come to fruition because he is sovereign over all of his creation. No matter the magnitude of your sin, if you are in Christ, if you repent of your sin, Romans 8.1 tells us there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that verse? There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. But if you're not in Christ today, the curse for disobedience is eternal. It is eternal separation from God in hell. The gospel, however, provides good news. It teaches that Jesus took the curse for all of those that repent of their sin and believe in faith. That Jesus came, lived the perfect life, was crucified, and was resurrected. If you come to faith in Christ today, there's more than just a glimmer of hope for you, there is unending, boundless, full, eternal hope for all that are in Christ. However bad you think you might be, Samson is probably worse. And yet God continues to use Samson. He's not making excuses for his sin. He's not condoning his sin. But God's plan over this creation trumps whatever we might ultimately do. Yes, our sin matters. Yes, we should confess it and repent of it. But God still used Samson to be his chosen agent to save his people from Philistine oppression. And for you, if you are in Christ or you are contemplating coming to faith in Christ, Jesus is your chosen instrument to save you from your spiritual bondage so that you can be reconciled to a holy and perfect and righteous God. That is the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, we have to confess to you that as we go through challenging passages like Samson's life and his judgeship, that we're prone to, to wonder why. But we need to be reminded that everything written in this book is for your people. It's for their edification. It's for their sanctification. And if they're not in Christ, it's to bring conviction upon their hearts so that they will turn from their sin and believe in the gospel. So we thank you for Samson's life. Not an example of somebody we should follow, but rather how we see you continuing to work through him to accomplish your purposes in the world. So continue to speak to us through this text as we continue our time of worship now. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.